story that I learned in school by O. Henry called The Gift of the Magi, except I always call it The Gift of the Magi because I like that better. So The Gift of the Magi, or The Gift of the Magi, was taken in sort of Reader's Digest condensed <laughs> into a poem. And when I had it in satisfactory poem shape, I set it to music, and it came out in the form of an operetta. It has a part for me, or a part for a girl, and a part for a fellow, and a part for a whole chorus full of sisters, cousins, and aunts. Unfortunately, I was the only one who showed up tonight, so... Oh, she 
Listening to WTBS Cambridge Community Service of MIT.
the cage He carried me off to his country For marriage to soon
Thank you. A, a while ago, I saw a very beautiful underground film called Valley. And since I saw the film, I've met some people who really knew Valley because it was, it was a movie about her as a person. She had a very strange career. She left Melbourne, Australia at about 17. She threw herself into what they called a red fit because she had lots and lots of thick red hair. And uh, at 17, she was running around, you know, having red-headed fits all over the place. And one day she had one and she said, um, I'm leaving this silly dance school because you're not teaching me anything and you're not letting me dance the way I want to. And I'm going off to Europe and I'm going to become famous any way I can. So at 17, she was all, had eyes all focused on stardom and she went off to Europe and uh, fell in on the beatnik thing, I guess that was at the time. The, whoops, there goes one pick. <laughs> Um, she got involved in, in the Bohemian thing in Paris, and finally she behaved so badly, according to the people of Paris, with witchcraft and all, that she was uh, kicked out of Paris. They did it very politely by refusing to renew her passport. So she could have been really depressed, and the movie goes into that. She said that she was very low then, and she didn't want to even live. But she met a guy named Rudy, which is very strange. So Rudy and Valley moved off to... <laughs> moved off to a little island in, in Italy, and there she lives with a lot of animals, and uh, she's very like an animal herself because she's very agile and she climbs all through caves, and she's really a wonderful person in spite of herself, and also she thinks she's very evil, actually, who knows, maybe she's, maybe she knows what she's doing. People would want to type her and call her the original flower child, and and uh, the one time that she did come back from her island, she appeared in concert with Donovan in England and danced so beautifully and everybody flipped out and she was approached by all sorts of people who offered her contracts and scared her back off to her island again. And I wrote a little song about her and it was just sitting around with one verse finished on it one day and I suddenly noticed that strange things were happening, you know. People were capitalizing on people like Valley and... and um, making them into sort of living commercials. So I thought if anybody was going to make a commercial out of my song to Valley, it should be me. <laughs> Does anyone have a flat pick? Good. Oh, that's really a little one. I hope I can hold on to it.
sides to a couple of things. <clears throat> it's called from those sides now. Or Dave and all calls it clouds. <laughs>
takes place in the city so it's a little a little bit noisier it's all about living in the Chelsea district of New York which was really a nice place to live until Andy Warhol made a movie about Chelsea girls and gave us all a bad reputation
I'm finally going to make a record. I, uh, <laughs> I just signed my contract with Reprise. That's Reprise, not Reprise. I learned how to say it right, too. <laughs> and uh, it should be coming out sometime this spring. It should be kind of fun, too, because it's... Well, it's sort of a story. It's, it's going to be called Song to a Seagull, which is a story, and all of the songs which make up the record repeat that story. And in the part where we take you down to the seaside, it's called Out of the City and Down to the Seaside section of the record. Some very strange stories of the sea happen, and among them is a song that I wrote about well, I don't really know what it's about. It's sort of, it's almost like suddenly in a song a character appeared to me that should be a dominant character someday in an operetta. And so because it was sort of like a lead character in an operetta, I took liberty with Gilbert and Sullivan and um, stole part of their title. I call this the Pirate of Penance. <laughs> standard tuning here. I had the fortune or the misfortune to get a chance at writing a theme song for a Canadian public affairs program. And I thought it would be a good time to write a song that could say some things that were on my mind in, 
and I had to say it in a very quiet way so as not to, uh, to upset people, you know, and I thought, well, it's got to be subtle enough that they won't understand what I'm trying to get across. It's got to be simple enough that a lot of people can understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> was flown, I was imported all the way from Los Angeles up to Toronto to do the New Year's Eve program, which was really dreadful, I must admit, it was just dreadful. And uh, the reason it was so dreadful was because, you know, I, I made a few compromises. I was told not to let them put arrangements with me. <coughs> and I should, have, I should have gone along with the people who told me to do that, but I didn't because the arranger gave me a big long sob story about how he tried to transcribe my music from the tuning so that he could work with it, and I really had sympathy for him there. And uh, so he said, well, gee, I've got all these string parts, and he showed me all these pieces of paper, and I knew he must have worked on it a long time, so I said, okay. And then I went back after I'd done all of my filming for the day, and that time it was about 9 o'clock, and the show went on the air at 10, so I sort of curled up in my motel room to watch the proceedings. Well, first of all, I began the show. I think the arranger mixed it because the orchestra was way out in front. And my guitar was just sort of like... <laughs> the whole guitar, you know, in the background. And I was somewhere in the middle, so that all you heard were his arrangements, which for the first song were, were uh, just not right. They weren't in the right key or something was wrong, I don't know. They were harmony lines, so you had this dominant orchestra, this big orchestra, and this girl sitting there, sort of silent mouthing on the screen. <laughs> that was the first awful thing, and then they had on John Diefenbaker, and he talked mostly about how winter was like a buffalo's breath. <laughs> and how they'd named a, a river after him in Saskatchewan, and he was very proud. Diefenbaker Creek up there. <laughs> 400 miles north of Prince Albert. <laughs> then I came on, you see, introducing for the new year the theme song of a public affairs program called The Way It Is. And, uh, oh, I know another thing I did that was really terrible. They said, uh, gee, we hear you're from Fort McLeod, Alberta, Joni. And I said, uh, no, actually, I'm from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And he said, oh. And, well, where would you, you know, we're really glad you're here this New Year's Eve. And where would you rather be? And I said, uh, if in Florida. <laughs> Here I was beginning the new year, Canadian, and I didn't say anything, you know, really Canadian, like, I'd rather be a moose jaw, sir. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then to top it all off, one of the arrangements he had written for 4-4, four, four, whereas I was actually playing in 3-4, and that time they mixed us equally. <laughs> matters worse, when I introduced the song called The Way It Is, they uh, ran the rehearsal take, so there I was on national television on New Year's Eve saying, hey, uh, we better take that one over again. Sometimes 
Smiling at your circles in 